Good morning, good afternoon. I'll get it right. Welcome to the Association of Lifelong Learners. We're happy that you're here today to learn about books. And we have a room full or partially full of book lovers. And we're hoping that you on Zoom will be uh, just as happy as we are to, to meet Sarah Grahowski and to learn from her what we can do for Christmas for all those loved children and teenagers and our families and our friends. Sarah was born in Alpena, lucky us, and she, um, she's been in love with books. Her family is in love with books. In fact, she told me that her family subscribed to book magazines before she was even born for her. They enrolled her. She's um, left us for about a decade to go to college and um, also to work in the book industry. She's a nationally recognized bookseller. And here at the library, which our gorgeous reopened library that I haven't had a chance to see, I hope all of you get there to see Sarah and everything else going on. But Sarah's the youth librarian. She's the outreach coordinator. And she's also director of marketing at, the, at our public library. I'm looking forward to everything you have to say, Sarah. I myself have some people I'm looking, trying to think of what to buy them for Christmas. And we hope this will be helpful to all of you also. Sarah. Thank you. So as long as my green light's on, then my sound's on, right? And just to confirm, I know I can see everyone here and they can see me, but at home, oh, mask down, okay. But at home, will they see my presentation or me or both? They should both. Both, okay, just wanted to make sure. And then, so um, again, my name is Sarah. I work at the Alpena County Library. Um, I am so lucky to do what I do. Um, I was a bookseller for a very long time. Um, during that time, I also worked um, reading through the slush pile for a literary agent for a little bit. So that's kind of, you know, the literary agent sells the book to the editor and the publisher, and then it gets published. So that was really fun to have an opportunity to see, you know, that very early part of the process. Um, and then I worked in, in book selling as a children's librarian for a long time, was very lucky to get work, to work with the American Bookseller Association. Um, so doing that, I got to go talk about different ways of selling books and displaying books and got to meet and talk to different authors and different booksellers. And, um, you know, I really love doing that. And I do love selling books, but my passion has always been getting the right book for the right kid in their hands at the right time. Like that is what I'm really passionate about. And I love bookstores. They are essential um, but in the library, I get to do so much more for a wider variety of kids because I was one of those kids growing up that, you know, like, like was mentioned, my parents did have me in a book subscription program when I was quite little. So we did have books around and they always made sure we had books, but we weren't the kids who could necessarily go buy a stack of books. So libraries are really important to me as are um, partnerships with nonprofits, but bookstores, I think, have a certain magic about them too. Um, another thing that I should mention that I do is I write for Publishers Weekly, which is um, a weekly magazine for the book world, essentially, and I'm very blessed to get to interview authors for them. I also write book reviews, so often if you'll see like something has five-starred reviews, maybe one of my reviews was one of those stars. Um, and that's really exciting to me because I know that by doing that, I have a broader reach even beyond our community. Um, so yes, my life basically is all about kids and teen books. Um, so I guess jumping in, um, if we could bring up my presentation, I'm hoping that I'll be able to see it too. There we go. And then let's see if we make it full screen. Will it let me click through? Oh, yep, it does let me, I think. Okay. There we go. Oh, except I need to go back now. Oh, that's a different button. Okay. Um, so this was a little bit about me. Like I mentioned, I did put my email on there as well. Um, if you need recommendations or to reach out for something not library related, and then also my library email too. 
Um, but if you mix them up, I'll just forward it to the other one. So I included these quotes because they kind of inspire me. So when I'm thinking about choosing the right book for the right reader, um, this quote that was in the program description, reading should not be presented to children as a chore, a duty, it should be offered as a gift. I think that's something really important to keep in mind. Um, John Shreska has said, expand the definition of reading to include nonfiction, humor, graphic novels, magazines, action, adventure, and yes, even websites. It's the pleasure of reading that counts. The focus will naturally broaden. A boy won't read shark books forever, or a girl, or anyone else for that matter. Um, and then from George Bernard Shaw, make it a rule to never give a child a book you would not read yourself. And finally, from the great Judy Bloom, let children read whatever they want and then talk about it with them. If parents and kids can talk together, you won't have as much censorship because we, will have, we won't have as much to fear. So those are kind of all things that I kept in mind as I was making this list. Um, I will also say that perhaps I should have, now that we have a couple of kids here, focus more on board books and picture books, but I find people, it's a little bit easier for people to find them themselves because they're more accessible, you can look through. So I do have some that I'm highlighting here, but at the end, there will also be a link to um, an online store essentially that I set up that has even more recommendations that I, because I couldn't possibly cover everything here. So the first thing we'll talk about is board books. Sometimes people don't know what board books are. So I included a little bit about that. So it's a book for very small children and it has pages that, that are pasted to heavy cardboard. So they hold up a little bit better. A normal picture book is 32 to 40 pages. This is more like 20 pages, sometimes even shorter. And some ones that people often see are Little Blue Truck, Good Night Moon, Brown Bear, Brown Bear, the Sandra Boynton books. A lot of people see those at baby showers. They're fantastic, but many people have them already. So I wanted to highlight this series by Hilary Luong. Um, there are four in the series. The first is called Will Sheep Sleep? A loud noise. Um, um, so they're all about early childhood milestones. Um, this one is of course about bedtime and I have some pages from the inside. So sheep has been playing all day and now he is tired. Will Hopsy help sleep, sleep, sheep sleep? Nope. And it keeps going through. And so they try, you know, a toy, they try a nightlight. And then of course they have to play shadow animals and things like that. So those, I think this series is fantastic. Here are three more in the series. Will Bear Share, Will Ladybug Hug, and Will Giraffe Laugh? And then I also wanted to highlight this board book that I think is super fun because it kind of looks at parts and pieces and different shapes and see how they all come together. So as your um, child or, you know, one to three year old specifically grows, they'll interact with this book in different ways. You can start out by talking about colors or the different shapes, and then you can start thinking about how will these different pieces come together and what animal or shape will they make? Um, and then maybe after that, you can start, you know, with construction paper or um, those little, um, plastic shapes that for the tesseracts or tessellations, um, you can use those to then make the animals in the book. So here's an example. Four shapes get together to make, does anyone have a guess what that might make? A turtle. And this one, seven shapes together to make, any guesses? A tiger. And as it goes through all of these different animals that are getting put together in the book come together. Um, I guess you could talk about shapes. You could also do counting with that um, on each page. So it kind of grows with your child. And then I included this one as well. Where is everyone by Tom Champ? This is a lift the flat book. It's a lift the flat book that I particularly like because it has little dips for little fingers to actually lift. A lot of times you kind of have to bend the book and try to get it up and the kids get frustrated and it's a mess. This one is so beautifully designed. Um, my niece, uh, Ellie, loves this one. Part of the reason, I don't have any interior shots of it because um, it was originally published, I think, in German. So the interior shots were all German. But um, for example, there's a sink and um, it says, who's washing the dishes? And behind it, it's a raccoon because a raccoon likes to like, you know, wash little things and um, with its hands. And so all of the things connect in that way too. 
Not only does it have household items that you might find, it has recognizable animals. And also for slightly older kids, you can start seeing how these animals associate with the images. And then these are not quite board books, but they are one of my favorite series. They're called Indestructibles. Um, these are really for age zero and up. They're not board, they're not cardboard, but they are made of a rip proof, ultra durable, tight woven material. So they can be chewed on, they're non-toxic. You can put them right in the, um, in the dishwasher or wash them in the sink if they get something on them. Um, I think a couple of them might have text, but most of them don't have text. So uh, the baby can look through it on their own. There's lots of bright colors. You can also look through and start identifying. And these are just three, but there are many, many books in this series. And then I also just wanted to talk about a couple um, picture books for the holidays. I included a couple Hanukkah books since it is currently Hanukkah. Meet the Latkes is one of my favorites. Um, and then the Hanukkah bear. And then a couple Christmas books that are favorites. Dasher, I grew up loving the movie Prancer. Um, it was my mom's favorite movie and we watched it every Christmas. And though this is not about Prancer, it has the same kind of vibe to me. Um, and it has beautiful, beautiful illustrations. And then Santa Jaws for something a little bit fun and different. I also have some different um, ones here that I'm just going to grab. So a few that aren't in the presentation, um, but are on the link that I'll share at the end is this one. It's called There's an Elf in Your Book. I love this. This is a series of books. There's, um, there's a monster in your book and there's a dragon in your book. And as you're going, it's very interactive and it guides you if you're someone who's not as comfortable oops, coming up with that on your own. So it says, oh, look, there's an elf in your book. And then it says, you need to be on the nice list if you want Santa to bring you Christmas presents. And it'll tell you to do things like um, when you're ready to take the test, turn the page and then shake the page to get the elf out and then spin the book around to make him dizzy, things like that. And then also this beautiful one, The Broken Ornament by Tony DiTerlizzi. Um, this one is also gorgeous. Um, so those are just a couple suggestions of things I had at home. And then I do have a copy of Dasher here for anyone who wants to look at it. And this also has very beautiful two page spreads. Okay. And now just some general picture books. Um, the Creature of Habit is brand new. It's one of my favorites. It is about um, this little guy who is a creature of habit and what happens when someone new comes to his island and disrupts his um, regular routines. And um, it's about seeing things from different perspectives, friendship. Here's a couple spreads from the inside. You can see the Creature of Habit doing his everyday things like he normally does. Says hello to the fish the rocks, the crab. And then here you can see what happens when his new little friend at the top of the coconut tree comes and kind of throws everything into disarray and how it was absolute madness. So that is one of my recent favorites. Um, also this one, Circle Under Berry. I don't think I brought a copy of this book, but it is my current obsession. Um, so this one is deceptively simple. Um, it starts like this, circle under berry, berry over square. Circle over berry under orange over square. And then as it goes on, yellow under diamond, diamond over green, and, and is berry over circle or a circle under berry? So there's more than just these images in the book. It expands out to different colors. There's a frog, there's a lion, there's a house. But as you go, it asks you to think about perspective. Um, when I read this with my nephew, Emmett, who's five, um, we started out by just, as we read, touching each one to know which was which. And then as it got to parts like this, we would say, well, what's another way that we could say this? So you could say berry under berry over circle, but you could also say berry next to berry and yellow next to yellow and red over circle or yellow 
under red um, or diamond. Um, and so later in the book, instead of saying red, they'll switch to scarlet. And instead of yellow, goldenrod. And so it kind of introduces you to all of these different concepts. Emmett, my nephew, loved to take it and turn it different ways to see if that made a difference. So he was spinning the book all around. Um, also, further in the book, for example, there is a frog. And the frog is made up of different shapes. And so he really liked to think about how, well, the stomach of the frog is a square. And the two legs, if you took them apart and put them together, it would form a heart. So he was looking at all of the different shapes and how these things can move. And he has asked, like I mentioned with the other book as an option, um, if we could make them out of um, construction paper so that we can experiment with all the different animals we can make and all of the different shapes that come together in a part. So I really love this one. Um, this next one is called Dream Street. It's by Trisha Alam Walker and Ekua Holmes. These, this author and illustrator are cousins. They grew up in the Roxbury neighborhood in Massachusetts. It's part of Boston. And this book is based on the street where they grew up. It's a very community-minded book. Um, I love Holmes's collage illustrations. Um, some more inner pictures. Um, and I just love the focus on, you know, as they're going through the book, they meet all of these different neighbors and the girls talk about, there's two girls in the book, actually, they're in another picture. So there's that one. This one is supposed to be the author and illustrator and it's them writing stories together. And now they've grown up to make these books together. They both have many books that I, well, not many, but multiple books that I definitely recommend. I do have this here to look at as well. Um, and the creature of habit. And then this next one, I am all for books that destigmatize and show a variety of different types of bodies and lifestyles. So Bodies Are Cool by Tyler Fetter is one of my favorites um, for thinking about body positivity and even body neutrality. Um, and so I have read this one with my niece and nephew as well. Um, Here's an example of the inside, lanky bodies, squat bodies, tall, short, or narrow bodies, somewhere in the middle bodies, bodies are cool. And I think that the refrains here are beautiful, but I especially love the illustrations. Within these pictures, you can find almost any different body type and skin tone, hair type that you can imagine. So this page is specifically focusing on height, but the next page, is focusing on skin and skin pigmentation. Um, so lots there. And then here, this is one of the final pages, but this body, that body, his and her and their body, however you define your body, bodies are cool. So everyone will see themselves in this book. And I think that it's also a great opportunity for kids to see different bodies or different um, disabilities and things like that too, and have a safe and um, appropriate space to ask questions about that. So in some of these illustrations, you'll see people who have, you know, um, different like heart monitors that you can see or um, trying to see even in this one, all different. There's ones with people in wheelchairs and women that have leg hair and women that don't and women who wear headscarves and women who don't. Just everything that you can imagine in this book. And then this next one, How to Find a Bird by Jennifer Ward and illustrated by Diane Sudaika. Um, this is one that I think it's really for any time of year, but it's really great when there's a lot of birds in Michigan. <laughs> um, so this one, kind of walks you through what you're listening to and looking for when you're out in nature um, in regards to birds. So it's great to, for kids who are already interested in birds, but I also think that it's a beautiful study on using your senses, you know, um, your sight, especially sense of hearing, feeling, and really all of them. So to find a bird, first you'll want to blend in. Um, and then, and move slowly. And then that's a great blue heron, which was my favorite bird growing up. Except I called them big, hairy bluebirds, I think. Um, and then another one about looking up and another about looking down. So all the different places you can find birds. 
So that's all that I really included for picture books. I could go on and on about picture books. I did bring some others to look at. And if we have time, I'll mention a few more. And all of them in the presentation and the ones that I mentioned that aren't in the presentation are on the link. So next I went into chapter books and transitional readers or early readers. Um, this is for ages five to eight. You know, there's always a little wiggle room. No child fits exactly in any category, but this is just kind of guidance. So one I wanted to talk about was Bobo and Pup Pup. This is about two friends, very minimal text, very um, bright, fun illustrations. The first two have just come out. I have them here to look at. Um, and they're very kind of humorous. Meet Yasmin is the first in a series. This is about um, a young girl who is Pakistani American and she has many, many different interests. So there's one about Yasmin cooking and one about her being an artist and a librarian. And this first book introduces her and her family. Um, and then the others kind of go into her different interests. And then Grumpy Monkey Freshly Squeezed. This is a series of picture books as well, but this is the first graphic, mm, it's not quite a graphic novel, but um, it has graphic novel elements in it, or comic elements is another um, way to say that. Um, and this one is very cute. It has little interstitials from Grumpy Monkey's parents. So included is from his mother, um, information about different types of primates and where a monkey fits in. And then there's another one from his dad that has a recipe for, I think they're banana popsicles or something. So that's included in there too. Also very funny. Another five to eight page, The Great Louise. This is another one about two friends. Um, there's quite a few out in this series. Um, the Hunger Heroes is brand new. It's from one of my favorite authors and illustrators, Jarrett Lerner. Um, he has many things, including a great activity book that I recommend. Um, but this is all from the point of view of these different um, food groups, which is pretty funny. And then Geraldine, Geraldine Poo, um, this is another early reader. And this one I love because it kind of um, introduces different foods. It touches on bullying a little bit. Um, and this also has um, a bit of a graphic novel bent to it. Another reason I included these is up at the top of each book, you'll see that there's a little symbol. One is a little penguin with a book. I believe those are penguin readers. Next are, um, it says a graphic novel chapter book. And then the last one is read graphic, I believe. So I wanted to include these because these are all um, series, not by the same author, not necessarily the same characters. But if you know, if you buy one of these and you know that your reader likes them, you can look for more that are under this imprint for lack of a better word i guess it's a it would be kind of a steam series but it's all different authors and then moving just a little bit up in age um i wanted to include some nonfiction. so these true rescue books are pretty fun um they're for seven to ten and there are versions of them for older readers too including for adults but this simplifies the story down for seven to ten so this one um a storm too soon is about a rescue operation and then beatrice zinker is one of my favorite series um at least three books in this series are out um shelly johannes who is the author is a michigan author which is fun um and this book about beatrice is beatrice is kind of the black sheep in her family um she's kind of always in the first pages of the book, if you pick it up, you see that there's a family photo and she's hanging upside down from a tree while everyone else is like lined up perfectly. So that's Beatrice, basically. Um, it's highly illustrated. Um, and I think it's a fun one for kids that like Junie B. Jones, that kind of thing. Um, a little bit sassy characters. And then Jojo McCoons. Um, this is the first in a new series. It is by an Ojibwe author, and the main character is Ojibwe too. Um, again, in the same kind of vein. This age of book usually focuses a lot on friendship um, and um, you know new new experiences at school, that kind of thing. Sometimes people ask me about that because they all seem to kind of revolve around the same topics. But I always try to remind adults that 
that is the number one thing for kids that age. That is what they're dealing with. And it happens in all different ways. So those themes never really get old for them. And then also for seven to 10, um, The Investigators is another illustrated chapter book series, Mystery, of course, very funny. Um, Mindy Kim and the Yummy Seaweed Business, another one um, kind of in the same vein, and Hand Me Down Magic. That is another series and it has kind of a magical bent to it. And then we're getting into middle grade. I want to check the time. Okay. I'm glad I didn't include more because I feel like I'm already talking very fast. Um, but there's so many more books I could talk about. So this middle grade um, is, of course, uh, Eight to 12 is kind of the general age for that. Um, in the library, you might call that the juvenile section. Um, some people call it tween. There's lots of different names for it, but I like middle grade. So the first one I'm going to talk about is Starfish by Lisa Phipps. This is a book that I wish that I had when I was that age. Um, it's for 10 and up. It is written in verse, um, free verse specifically. And I'm a huge fan of verse novels because I think that there's this thing in the US, possibly other places too, where people think that they either like poetry or it's over their head. And I think that if we start giving kids poetry when they're younger and not just Shel Silverstein and things like that, which I think is great, but we kind of stop after that. Um, but novels and verse are one of my favorite ways to introduce poetry to kids. And um, I, I think that especially works for reluctant readers because it really cuts to the heart of the story. You know, only the words that really need to be there are there. And so it reads a lot faster, but it's also very impactful. There's not really any time that drags at all. It also lends itself very well to be read out loud or listened to on audiobook, which is a plus. And it's sometimes not as overwhelming because there's less um, words overall. So this one by Lisa Phipps, is about a girl named Ellie. Um, ever since her fifth birthday, she's been, well, even before really, but especially starting at her first, fifth birthday party, um, which was a, a pool party. She's been bullied for her weight. Um, and it's not only people at school that pick on her and bully her, bully her for her weight. She also has to deal with her mother's constant comments about her weight and what she looks like. And, um, she has these fat girl rules that she lives by, such as no making waves, avoid eating in public, don't move so fast that your body jiggles. Um, but her place that she feels safe, kind of ironically, is in her backyard pool, especially when she's free floating and she can't feel her body at all. And she's just spread out in a starfish. And um, so this is kind of her story about making friends with her next door neighbor, about finding support, you know, standing up to her mom and finding support within her family um, and learning to accept her body, if not love it, which I think is really important. And I think with social media being as prevalent as it is, and it's not at all a new issue, but kids are so aware of their bodies and what they look like. And this book is by no means telling you, you know, you should be fat or you should be thin. It's just telling you, Bodies come in all different sizes and you are still valid and important. The next one is Amari and the Knight Brothers by B.B. Alston. Um, this book, I have to say, uh, I run a book club at the library and this book was beloved by everyone in the book club. Um, they talk about it all the time and are waiting for the sequel to come out next year. It actually got pushed back and they were disappointed about that. Um, paper shortages, you know, supply chain. Uh, so this one is def it's fantasy. It's for fans of kids who like things like Harry Potter and that, but it's about a girl named Amari Peters who um, is trying to find her missing brother. And everyone kind of just assumes that he's just gone off. He's gotten in trouble perhaps, but she knows that her brother would never do that. And she finds out that he actually works for the Bureau of Sur Supernatural Affairs and that he has been taken or is missing and she must find him. And she comes in and right away finds out that she has um, powers that she never knew existed and that kind of make her stand out and make her a target. Um, so this one is fun. It deals a lot with, um, you know, some bullying, but um, 
mostly just a really, really great adventure story. Next, we have Katie the Cat Sitter by Colleen A. F. Venable and Stephanie Yu. This is a graphic novel. Um, we also read this one for book club, actually. Um, so this is about Katie, who really wants to go to summer camp, but they can't afford it. So she's decided that she's going to find a way to make some money, and she tries cleaning, and she tries this and that, and really, she's not good at anything. Um, so when her upstairs neighbor asks her to cat sit, she says, sure, not knowing that her upstairs neighbor has 217 cats. And these are not normal cats. They are, one's a hacker. One is um, a chef. They all have, in, in the end papers of the book, you can see all the cats and their names and what they do. The kids had a lot of fun coming up with what their cat superpower might be. Um, so she ends up having to figure out what exactly is going on with her neighbor. And does she really even want to go to summer camp at all? Um, so that's the first in a series. Violets are Blue by Barbara D. I love Barbara D's books. I think that they're books that sometimes give adults pause because they deal with some heavier topics. But I think that we have to realize that even if our kids aren't dealing with this in their day-to-day -day life, they're still hearing about it, they're still seeing it, and they, they have classmates who are going through things like this. And I think it's important not only to see yourself in books, but to see other people as well. So Violets Are Blue is Barbara D's newest book. It's about 12-year-old Ren who um, loves special effects makeup. And anyone who is on YouTube at all, which is a lot of younger kids, know that there are so many makeup videos on there, how to and special effects. And so Ren is very into special effects makeup. Um, but part of that has to do with hiding herself. Not only is she passionate about it, but she's dealing with a lot of things at home, um, including her parents being divorced and her mom suddenly becoming a lot more secretive and kind of locking her bedroom door and just not being as reliable. Things are just not right. And she doesn't quite know what's going on. So in this book, um, not only does she start letting her creativity and her passion take center stage, she also has to learn how to ask for help with what's happening with her mom. And what's happening is that her mom has um, a, an opioid addiction. Um, and so I think it's not um, unknown that this is a growing issue in the US and there are so many kids dealing with it and so many kids dealing with it alone. And sometimes they don't even know what the signs are. They don't even know that that's what's going on at home. And so I love this book, not only because it deals with that in a very tactful, safe way, but it also shows Ren with this passion and skill and what she does with it. And she ends up working on a theater production at school. So um, another one that I'm a fan of and all of her backlists as well. Millionaires for, the, for a Month by Stacey McAnulty. Um, this one is about two friends, Felix and, well, they're actually not friends, I have to say in the beginning. Uh, they're actually quite opposite. So they're on a school trip and they find a wallet that has been lost. And inside is not that much money, um, but it belongs to billionaire Laura Friendly. Um, I think Jeff Bezos, but local, I guess. Um, so so um, they return the wallet, but not before taking the money out that they found. And um, when they return it, she knows that it's missing. And she basically tells them that, I want to get the number right here. Um, she tells them that even a penny has value. A penny doubled every day for 30 days is 5,368,000, no, 5,368,709.12. 5, and so she um, tells them that she's going to give them a penny and double it every day for 30 days. And they have to spend that money the trick is, is that there's a list of rules. Like they cannot give to charity. They can't buy things for other people. And so what all of this comes down to is um, it's a story about thinking about, you know, the distribution of wealth in a way and how much money do you actually have and how should that money be used? How can you do good with that money? Um, they, it was very interesting. We read this for book club too. Very interesting for the kids to think, oh, well, what would I do with the money? Because the catch here is that if they don't spend it all, even with these rules, they have to give it all back. 
and everything that they got. So they're really trying to beat the clock here and it becomes very difficult. Um, the next one is Yusuf Azim is not a hero by Sadia Faruqi. This is the same author who wrote um, Meet Yasmin. Um, this is her uh, one of her middle grade novels. She has quite a few, um, but this is the new one. I think it's especially timely. It is about um, Yusuf, who is um, living in the contemporary U.S. It's actually set in 2021, um, leading up to September 11th. So it is about that. And um, he is a uh, Muslim American and he lives in Texas. And so it's his story of understanding September 11th and what it means and still means. Um, I think for so many kids today, it, it's historical to them. You know, they weren't there. It happened before they were born and it feels like something really far removed. But this book kind of brings it back to the forefront, um, which is important because it still is a big part of life and still does affect how we see certain groups of people in this country. One of my favorite things about the book is that um, in it, Yusuf's uncle, who was alive during, or who was a child in school, about my age, actually, when um, September 11th happened, had kept a journal. So he's reading his uncle's journal as he's dealing with um, Islamophobia and um, bullying in the lead up to the 20th anniversary for 9-11. So it kind of revisits that again. Um, but it's really beautifully done. I'm kind of talking about like the, the issue things in these books, but those are I want to be clear that none of that is what the entire book is about. These are very much about the characters and their lives too, but these are kind of some of the things you'll find inside. And then we were talking about this one earlier, Stunt Boy in the Meantime by Jason Reynolds and Raul III. This is a hybrid novel, I would call it. So it has a lot of illustrated elements and graphic novel elements, but also prose. Um, but even the text in it, um, is handwritten, I believe. So it's it's a really cool book. Um, Stunt Boy is uh, the superhero that you've never heard of. And his uh, job is to keep them safe. And he's a warrior. He gets something, um, oh, what does he call them? I'm going to say it wrong, but he basically has um, anxiety. He's dealing with his parents. Um, in the title, it's the meantime. In the book, it's mean time separated out. His parents are always fighting. He doesn't really know what's going on. All he knows is that they're soon going to have two apartments, one upstairs and one downstairs. Um, so uh, it's a little bit about that, but it's also about the people in his neighborhood, which he has this, this apartment complex that he lives in where they have these great like block parties. And um, Along the way, he also finds out about this man in the building who is the super. Of course, that they mean like the, the superintendent of the building um, who, who does uh, the, the maintenance and upkeep and whatnot, but he thinks of him as a superhero. I did bring a copy of this one to look through. Um, oh yes, the worry wiggles, the frets is what he calls it. So I love this one because it does touch on anxiety, which I think a lot of kids are dealing with um, pretty much always, but especially right now. This one by Candidly Klein or by Catherine Ormsby is another favorite. It's about a girl who um, lives down in Tennessee and she has always wanted to be a singer songwriter. Her favorite artists are like Dolly Parton and um, other artists like that. And she has, she wants to take part in a singer songwriter workshop, but her parent, her mom does not have the money and she's really supposed to be staying home with her grandmother who has Alzheimer's. Um, but she finds a way to go and start um, finding her way to the stage and finding a way to be open about her passion for music, something that she's kept really close to the heart. Another thing about this book that I love is that um, Klein does like girls and um, that's something that she hasn't told anyone either. And so in this musician's workshop, she meets someone named Sylvie who becomes her first crush. And it's of course very appropriate for this age, it's for eight to 12, but I think that it's really important to have that representation too. And then the bookshop of Dust and Dreams by Mindy Thompson. 
Uh, this one's set in 1944 in Sutton, New York, in a magical bookshop. And this bookshop um, is one of many bookshops that only appear to people when they need them the most. And um, this girl in the book, um, the store is called Rhyme and Reason. Poppy, the main character, her um, family has always taken care of this bookstore. And she knows that um, there are many rules, including that you can never use the bookstore's magic for your own gain. And when the bookstore starts acting strangely, and so do some of the other bookstores, she realizes that someone has broken that rule and she has to figure out who and why. This is also set against the backdrop of World War II, which does play into it. Um, her older brother could not join, um, which plays into the story, but his best friend is fighting. And that's one of the things that she talks about a lot in the book and plays into the plot. Um, and then some nonfiction, I have to go faster. Um, African Icons by Tracy Baptiste. I love this book. It has illustrated portraits of all of the, the historical figures that are talked about in the book. I really like history, but all through school and really after, I didn't learn a lot about African history in particular, like the continent of Africa. And so many things started there and then spread. Um, so I found this absolutely fascinating. Um, the illustrations are also beautiful. Um, so for any history lovers, this is a good one. It's kind of biographical too. Um, and then All 13, The Incredible Cave Rescue of the Thai Boys Soccer Team by Christina Sunterbat. This one um, is really well researched. I believe she even interviewed some of the boys. Um, so this one, uh, anyone who likes, you know, true high stakes stories, especially because these boys are, were not, you know, very old. Um, so that's really relatable. History Smashers is a great series. I just pulled this one called The Mayflower because we just had Thanksgiving. They're by Kate Messner, who's written lots of really great books for kids um, and illustrated by Dylan Maconis. Um, and so these kind of go into some of the myths around things. There's one about Pearl Harbor. Um, I think there's one about like the women's rights movement um, with uh, illustrated elements. Radium Girls, some people might know the adult version of this book. It's now been adapted for young readers, so it kind of cut out some of the maybe gorier things. Um, uh, so some people know the history of the Radium Girls. Um, they worked in factories mostly, and they were using radium, and it was basically poisoning them. Um, so that's that story. And then now getting into young adult. So this is 13 and up, sometimes 12 and up, sometimes even 11, depending on your reader. Um, In the Wild Light by Jeff Zentner. He has many wonderful books. This is his newest and one of my favorites. Um, it is about um, Cash and Delaney, two best friends. Delaney is kind of a science whiz. And with Cash's help, they find this... Um, this uh, bacteria basically that can, this needed for the science community. And they end up getting offered scholarships out of their small Appalachian town to go to this boarding school in Connecticut, which is different than anything they've ever experienced growing up rural and, um, you know, disadvantaged in, in the South. Um, and so Cash doesn't necessarily want to go, but Delaney won't go without him. So he ends up going and this book is about that experience and the people he meets, but it's, even though mostly it takes place in Connecticut, it's really about that love of home and the people that make things home and his um, relationship with his grandparents who have raised him because his mother um, died from an overdose. So um, it's just beautifully done along the way cash realizes that he loves poetry and um, he starts writing poems and the poems in there, even thinking about them, give me goosebumps. Um, of course, Jeff Zentner, the author wrote the poems and now I'm hoping that he publishes a collection of poems, um, but they're so powerful. And I think that sometimes um, there's a lot of similarities between Appalachia and small town Michigan. And so I think a lot of kids will relate to this. I love that it kind of destigmatizes um, poetry a little bit, especially uh, boy loving poetry. Roxy by Neil and Jared Schusterman. 
Um, this one I was kind of skeptical about before I read it. My mom ended up reading it and liking it too, which I have to mention because it has a bit of a wild premise. Um, but oops, that's the wrong description there. Um, so this one is about uh, two siblings, twins, who are caught in the clutches of um, two different drugs, essentially oxycodone uh, or oxycontin and Adderall for ADHD. And the book is from, it shifts perspectives between Roxy, um, the oxycodone, and then Addie, the Adderall, and then the two siblings. And you know at the beginning that one will not make it through. Um, at the very beginning of the book, you know someone has died. Um, but you don't know who or how. And you know that these two drugs who are basically anthropomorphized for the book, they're characters of their own. And as you go, there's many other characters that you can start to identify as different drugs. And it's really about the opioid epidemic and how, how it doesn't always start for people like we think and how these two characters, the, these two siblings, you never would have thought that they'd find themselves in these, this position. And how um, really it's only us like as a society who can stop what's happening because it's beyond so many of our control, including young people. Um, Slingshot by, my, by Mercedes Helwin, um, one of my favorite YA uh, romance books of the year. However, I think the reason that I love it is actually that um, it doesn't necessarily have the ending that some people would want. And I think that it's really important to have books that don't necessarily end in the happily ever after for teens, because I was always the one reading the happily ever afters. And I think sometimes it kind of sets you up for expectations that aren't realistic. Um, this one took me immediately back to being a teen. The emotions here are so raw, the feelings of a first crush, first falling in love, so powerful. Um, I think it'd be an interesting one to discuss with, with a teen. This one, Amelia on a Bridge by Ashley Shoemaker, um, is about a girl who goes to um, a tourist town in Michigan every year um, and to uh, a bookstore that she she loves. Oh, no, I think I got that wrong, actually. But anyway, it has to do with... Um, her finally meeting her favorite author, who was a teen author, so he's near in age to her, and her going through, um, it's basically a story about both of their grief and how they help each other get through this grief, and it's set in a magical bookstore. Not literally magical, but a bookstore that you'd very much like to visit. Um, it's kind of a tearjerker. Empire of Dreams by Ray Carson is fantasy. I included this one because it has no romance in it. Um, a lot of young adult books have romance in them. This one um, is actually comes after a trilogy that can be read with it or separately. Um, so I'm going to keep going faster. Um, Pride and Premeditation. This is by a Michigan author. It's a retelling of Pride and Prejudice, but a murder mystery. Um, so that one's really fun. Firekeeper's Daughter by Angeline Bully. Um, this one, of course, is set up in Marquette and Sugar Island. It is a mystery. It's very well done. Um, the author and the main character are, are Ojibwe. Um, I love this one because it reads really quickly, I think, and she touches on so many different things, but it never feels like it's overwhelmed. Um, Sunny Song Will Never Be Famous. This is about um, a girl who ends up having to... Um, She's a social media influencer and she ends up having to go work on a farm for the summer and she has no access to internet. And that's kind of what happens. There's cute romance in it. Um, Off the Record by Cameron Garrett. This is about a young journalist. Cameron Garrett herself is actually, she might not even be 21. Her first book I think came out when she was 17 and this is her second one. Um, it's about a young journalist who gets to go interview um, this basically tour with this cast of this upcoming movie and along the way she finds out that um the director i believe has um, sexual assault allegations against him and so her story turns into something different than she expected um kent state by deborah wiles um you know in light of what just happened i thought that 
I would include this one. Um, it is, of course, about the Kent State shooting. It is in verse. Um, it's really powerful. I think it makes you think a lot and it has every perspective you could imagine. And I think that's what I really liked about it. You know, it had one of the perspectives is the National Guard. One is um, people who just live in the community around Kent State. Some are from protesters. Some are from just students who just happen to be there. Um, yeah, that's, yeah. Um, this one, Killer, uh, Killers of the Flower Moon. This is about the birth of the FBI and the Osage murders. This is an adult book, but it's been adapted for young readers here for 10 and up actually. So it kind of works for middle grade readers too. Big Questions book of Sex and Consent by Donna Freitas. Um, I kind of wish I had had this book too. I think it's good for adults as well. I got a lot out of it reading it. Um, really covers anything you could think of. Um, I like to recommend these for kind of Christmas things because I think it can be sometimes awkward to give those to kids. But if you slip it in with a fiction book, then you know they've just got two books and they can pick this up when they want. But I also encourage you to read it and have a conversation about it. Uh, the Cat I Never Named by Amra Sabiq al -Rayez. This is a wonderful memoir. Um, Amra is a friend, uh, but this is about um, her surviving the Bosnian genocide um, in the 1990s. She is now a uh, teacher at Brown. Um, she is, you know, one of the heads of the education department, I think, there. Um, so this is her story. To me, it feels incredibly relevant because it was just 1995. Although when I did say that to one of the teens that I was talking to about it, she did say, my parents weren't even married then. So I guess it's not as recent as I think it is. But um, we read this for Summer Book Club, actually. And I have a lot of readers who love fiction, but don't think they like nonfiction. And they did kind of change their mind after this one. Um, it does kind of focus a bit or follow this thread of the cat that shows up on the first day when the um, when when people come into their town and is with them throughout the whole thing and many instances in which they kind of credit the cat for helping them survive. For example, there's this one time when they're up on this bridge, but then they go to look for a cat and the cat and as they leave, the bridge is bombed and everyone on it dies, um, but they survived and because of Mossy, their cat. Um, and then Hey Kiddo by Jarrett K. Krizaksha. This is a graphic novel. Um, it's definitely for 12 and up, but it's for those kids that really like, like Raina Telgemeier, like Smile and those books, which are also memoirs. This one is a little bit more serious because it is for teens. Um, Jarrett has lots of books for picture books and chapter books and other graphic novels for younger, but this one is the story of his life growing up raised by his grandparents. Um, he didn't know his dad and his mother had substance abuse problems. Um, so it's about them and really they're supporting him in his art and his passions. Um, they're pretty funny in the book. There is swearing, but it's from the grandparents, not from him. Um, and uh, it's just a beautiful story. I cried a lot when I read it. And I think for kids who like this, you know, there's so many opportunities to get to know Jared online. He does many online things and he's given like TED talks and things. So for kids that see themselves in this book, I think it's really important, but it's also again, a window for others. Okay. And then um, shop local and shop small, please. So to buy any of these that you might be interested in, I definitely recommend checking out Parallel 45 Books and Gifts. They're downtown. They can order anything that you need. Um, also, uh, turn the page over by what used to be Neiman's. They can also order books for you too. Um, they carry mostly used, but they can order new books. Um, I didn't have a logo for them handy. Um, the next one that I'll recommend is Bookshop. I love Bookshop. Um, if you would rather, you can shop through Parallel 45 on Bookshop actually. So it's bookshop.org. It's a website that was created as, it's not exactly a nonprofit. It's like a B Corp, I think it's called. But basically a percentage of all sales on Bookshop go back to independent bookstores. And if you have an independent bookstore that you like, like Parallel 45, you type them in and everything you buy 
the percentage goes directly to them and they get like a cash out of it, which is really nice because having a book, uh, a website is very expensive and most independent businesses aren't able to do so. So this is a way to kind of host that for them. Um, you can also ship wherever you want. Um, it'll give you read alikes. Parallel 45 has a page that has more book recommendations that they've put on. Um, and then Libro FM, I like to recommend for audiobooks. If you are familiar with the library, we of course have Libby that you can use for free. But if you'd like to buy audiobooks, most people know about Audible. Libro FM is much better service. Not only does the does a percentage of sales also go back to independent bookstores, and you can shop through the bookstores that you love. Parallel Forty Five might have a shop on there. Um, mine is through Saturn Books and Gaylord. Um, and the great thing about Libra FM is that unlike Audible, everything that you buy through them is actually yours. So in Audible, if you buy something, it can only like stay in the app. And if you ever cancel, you don't own it. You can't access it. Libro, you actually own the files and they're yours no matter what. And then down at the bottom, Shop Now is the link directly to my bookshop page that I set up that has all of these books and lots, lots more because I can't stop. <laughs> so I spoke very fast. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Does anyone have questions? I know it's past two already, just slightly. The past three, it's three. I ran out of room. <laughs> and like I said, they this PowerPoint we can make available. And also on Bookshop, you can literally click, it'll bring up, the description, it'll bring up the age, the price, it'll bring up if it's available in paperback or hardcover or audio. Um, it's just super easy to shop on there. I do it all the time, even though I have indie, indie bookstores that I shop at in person too. So. Sarah, do you have students from the school system come in to the library? Yes. Yes. So we're going to start up um, school visits again as soon as we have that figured out with transportation and what the schools, you know, their limitations. But um, so we don't have any actual like classes coming in right now. But what we've been doing, in fact, we have one tomorrow is these virtual author visits. And so, um, for example, the one that we had a month or so ago, it was an author that was from Philadelphia, author illustrator, and she has a studio in an old school in downtown Philadelphia. And she gave the, gave the kids a tour of her studio and let them see out the, the Philadelphia skyline out the window. She read her newest book to them. She showed them what her illustration process is. So we've mostly been doing things like that and mostly virtual. Um, but we will be starting up again school visits, story times, hopefully in person author visits eventually. Um, it's all just so up in the air, especially because we just opened on the 15th. So we're, we're working on getting everything back together. But um, did you have a specific question about that or just that kind of answer? I wondered because my, my son teaches uh, in Dexter outside oh. of Ryan Harbor. And he reads every day to his students. He teaches fourth grade. Mm -hmm. Kids love it. But his goal is to get them to love to read themselves. And so he gives them a list at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. I think it's 10 books they need to read. Yeah. And there is a list that they can choose from. But when they're finished, they have to come and tell them about their book. Nice. It's, like, it's an audio, uh, it's a, an oral book. Right. So, I love that. Yeah. And one of the things he's found is that kids who didn't care to read, and they'll beg him to go to the next chapter. Mm -hmm. and of course, he won't because he wants to keep them. In. Right. And they will just oh please, please read the next one. We got to know. And, and he won't do that. And the other thing that he does is often teachers get gifts. Ah, yes. And it's been known now that he likes gift certificates to yeah. Nickel Bookstore. And then he buys books for the class. Right. That's something that I would love to do. I don't know if anyone's familiar, but we started using this platform called Beanstack for summer reading. And so there are ways to create challenges in there. And I would love 
probably shouldn't say this on camera because nothing is confirmed, but what I would love to do is basically have a list of books that kids are challenged to read each year. You know, they have a certain amount of time. And then it, when they complete the list and maybe write or tell a book report, then they get a like sweatshirt or t-shirt with the year on it and a list of all the books that they read. And so each year they can collect another one. I would love to do something like that. Another thing that we have planned, um, but haven't quite done yet, we have purchased the books. It's just a matter of figuring out when the schools are ready is a battle of the books, bringing that back again. I loved that when I was a kid. So um, we've bought the books. We started writing questions. I'm just not sure when it'll start. Um, and that'll probably be for fifth and sixth grade. So we are looking to do many more things and I am always open to suggestions or things that you've seen elsewhere. So. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. I wish Oops. every one of you could be here to see this table of books that Sarah's brought in. It's been an exciting time and I've been making notes. I imagine you have at home too. Um, I can't say enough, Sarah. Really, this has been fascinating. I'm and so Sarah glad. Sarah has told us that she'll come back next quarterly, perhaps, or maybe at least um, springtime to give us some ideas for summer reading, because she knows so much about books, not just children's books, but any kind of books, really. I do read adult books, too. <laughs> I'm joking. I'd like to mention that Paul is doing a presentation at the library at Monday. Thank you, Marlene. That was that was the thing I was going to mention too, because we're talking about the library and all the fantastic things we have here in town, and all is going there Monday at uh, 11 a.m. And if you would like to join, you can call us, join us, call the office, call Judy, and also Monday, just um, to tell you that also Monday at 2 p.m., Katie Wolf from NOAA is going to be giving a fantastic presentation here in Madeline Briggs and on Zoom about the waterfront renovations and modernizations and exciting things happening at the Marine Sanctuary. So we hope that you'll um, check out the program guide. There is a quarterly program guide that comes out with our curriculum and you can get that readily just by calling our office and Judy will help you. She helps us all in a million different ways and you can find fascinating things to do with the lifelong learners. So again, um, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. It's been a wonderful time with you. I'm so glad. It went by so fast. <laughs>